what is color to you? Color is what brings ideas to life. Color is sharing emotions with the world. Color is what captures the moment. For us, color is a combination of precise calculations and well-defined algorithms, uncompromising design and engineering, relentlessly refining our methods, and spending countless hours to perfect our product. For us, that is color. Every detail counts. Our promise is to give you the most color critical monitor ever and to vibrantly bring your vision to life. With your color, the true color. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vicente Lachschmidt, and I'm the Digital Marketing Manager for BenQ in Central and Eastern Europe. And it is my great, great pleasure and very, very excited to welcome you all today to today's Fashion Photography Webinar with Agatha Serge. And uh, I can't tell you how excited Agatha and I are to present this to you. This has been uh, many months in the working, and uh, we're both just so thrilled also at the reception so far. Um, for those of you who don't know, we're at over 900 registrations for today's webinar. It's just phenomenal to see how many people are interested and how many people are, how many fans of Agatha have come also to see her work and to get to, to engage with her, to get to know her better. And it's just very, very, very exciting. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to go over uh, two, two important aspects. 
The first of which being that today's webinar will be sent to you. So as a recording, will be sent to you tomorrow uh, um, in a tomorrow's email. And the second point is that all of the visitors today, all of you participants are also going to be receiving a small present from BankU, which is a 10% discount code for our European viewers uh, on the AccuColor monitors from the PD and SW lineup, which is valid for one month. Now, for those of you who don't know, BankQ has a line of uh, PD monitors, which are made for designers, and SW monitors, which are made for photographers. These monitors are built from the ground up to, to really help an artist to work with their, with their craft. Whether you're just beginning and you're looking for an entry-level monitor, you're looking for something to, to just start off with a hobby perhaps, or you're someone really that's like on Agatha's level, really someone who does this as a profession, as their day in and day out job, as their main uh, vocation. BenQ has created these monitors to really be designed to help artists uh, fulfill their craft to the best, to the best, uh, to the best degree possible. Uh, if you've ever worked before with printing, if you've worked before with uh, with your with design work or photography work, you know that sometimes if you work on a non-professional monitor that the colors can sometimes not look right. You'll be working on one monitor, you'll print it out, and the colors will just won't be matching. Or you'll be wishing for some more umph, some more features for your monitor. The AccuColor monitors, the PD and SW monitors, are built from the ground up to have the most accurate colors possible. Each and every single monitor before being sent out is individually calibrated uh, to really ensure the best color accuracy possible. And there's a host of other really exciting uh, really exciting features as well in terms of um, uh, really exciting features for um, for designers as well. One of my personal favorites is the hotkey puck, which is a little uh, swivel, a little uh, control, a little control, a remote control that you have that you can switch between different color modes. You can also switch between uh, different settings that you require, and it really speeds up the process for a lot of a lot of designers and photographers. And finally, what I want to say on that point is do not take our word for it. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of working with not just Agatha, but a, really a host of extremely talented and, and such creative people here in Europe. And I really encourage you to, to, to check the reviews online yourself. Every single review that BankQ does is always based upon transparency and honesty. We never send scripts to our reviewers or to our artists for them to copy and to read off in a, in a review. And the same is with Agatha as well. It's really a collaboration based upon mutual respect and mutual honesty and transparency with you as well, because it's also important for us as a, uh, as a company to also receive that honest feedback to be able to siphon that into how we also make uh, future monitors. The final thing I want to say is that uh, we'll have the content of the webinar. At the end, we are going to have Q&A. You're free to ask the questions now if you want to, but just keep in mind that we won't be getting to that until the very end. On to Agatha herself. If you are not following Agatha's work yet, then you really, really should. Agatha Sadish is a Polish photographer, a professional fashion photographer. And when I say professional, it really does not get more professional than this, working regularly with uh, publications of Vogue, of Elle, of Le Officiel, and of Vanity Fair as well. And Agatha is extremely pro prolific considering she's only in, I believe, less than a decade been work working with photography and already has such an incredible portfolio regularly travels to New York, to Los Angeles also, and all that while living in, in Poland. Just an incredible, incredible uh, portfolio, an incredible person. And uh, as you'll get to know during the webinar as well, really a very sweet and very, very nice person that I, I, I think you'll all very, very much enjoy her, her webinar. That is enough for me. Uh, with that, I'd like to now uh, welcome Agata onto the stage. Hi guys, do you hear me the sunset so we can just go further? Do you hear me well? Hi, do you hear me well? There you go, Agatha. Yeah, perfect, thank you so much. 
Hi guys, my name is Agata Sturge. I'm a fashion and beauty photographer uh, based in Poland. Um, I'm really bad with self-introduction, but Vincent introduced me very nicely. Thank you so much. It's so nice to hear such a kind word about myself. Um, I'm really happy I'm here, but also a bit stressed. I got some messages yesterday from some of you that you're asking me to speak a bit slower than usual. I don't post those events um, often, but I had some uh, online workshops before, and I know that I tend to speak pretty fast, and I'm sorry about it, but it's all because of the stress. So I hope I'm going to be talking nice and slow this time. Um, so I know that you know, I'm also thrilled, thrilled and surprised a lot about among participants today. It's like Vincent has said, over 900 participants. It's well overwhelming, but thank you so much. It's so nice to have you all here. Um, so I know that some of you are uh, following me on Instagram and Facebook, but I know that also there's a lot of people that are following me. Thank you. Um, so I will still introduce myself. Like I said, my name is Agata Search. I'm really happy to host this webinar for you. Um, I'm working mostly as a fashion photographer and a beauty photographer, but also as a commercial photographer. And today this webinar is going to be about portfolio building on how uh, to stay up to date with trends. Uh, I'm going to show you a bit about my mood boards and how I'm creating those mood boards and how I'm preparing for the, uh, for the photo shoots and also um, what is my potential year? So I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, like Vincent mentioned in the beginning, you can ask questions. I'm not going to see them now, but I'm going to see them in the end of the webinar, and then I'm going to try to respond as many as possible. So let's go. Um, portfolio building. Is it important to be up to date with trends? Well, the very simple answer, at least for me, is absolutely yes. And I mean, being a fashion photographer is being up to date with trends. I mean, for me, working as a fashion photographer is working also for commercial and fashion clients. So they want to be up to date with trends to be able to also sell their clothing. And my um, role in that part is to just make those images as um, good for them as possible. So it basically means that they will be able to sell better and they will be able to showcase they work better as well. Um, I thought it's going to be a lot easier for me to show you uh, how my photography has changed through the years because it has changed a lot and that's also how I was going uh, and trying to uh, keep up with the photography trends. So you can follow my work on Instagram, Facebook and TikTok from this year as well. So Instagram mostly is a place that I'm showing of course my portfolio and my work but I'm also showing some backstage and on my Instagram stories from time to time you also see some educational content. On Facebook I'm only showing right now like full uh, projects and on TikTok starting this year uh, I'm going to be showing uh, some of the backstage videos. I'm just starting right, right now I hope to deliver good content very very soon. So I've been working for a lot of uh, magazine work, magazines worldwide. Um, lately a lot for uh, Vogue Russia, Vanity Fair Italia, a lot of officials in different countries a lot of uh, Polish magazines as well. I used to, like Vincent to mention, uh, work a lot in New York and LA, which uh, uh, got cut off because of the pandemic. But thankfully, I hope everything hurt. Um, starting November, we can travel, I mean, uh, Europe can travel again to, to the US, which I'm really happy about. And I'm going to start uh, traveling. I'm going to be the first person in the plane on the first of uh, November, probably. Um, so I hope I can deliver also uh, some new uh, amazing content for my clients and also for, uh, for you to see. I have a short list of my clients on the left as well and a list of my portfolio on the right. So it all has started with the Freckles project and it gave me a lot of exposure and I had a lot of opportunities because of that project. And I'm going to give you a heads up because maybe some of you don't know the project that well. Um, it's a series of 50 portraits. At the beginning, there were all women, uh, most models. Then I started approaching people on streets, trains, uh, whenever I saw someone who actually fitted the project and uh, seemed interesting to me. And then I started expanding, and um, right now it's like 50 different people from all around the world. Um, left, uh, first one on the left is uh, Costa Rican model Elena. So I went to Costa Rica especially um, for two weeks to work and then uh, I saw this beautiful girl in the model agency and she was absolutely amazing for me. I mean that's how the whole project started 
Um, and this is the first image that I was actually taking, really knowing why I'm using serene equipment, why I'm using that background, why I want to shoot this. And when I was talking with Elena, I um, received a lot of uh, emotions from her regarding uh, having freckles. I mean, she told me that it was a bit difficult for her at the beginning in the mod um, model industry. And then when I started talking with a lot of girls, not only models, but also um, people who don't work uh, necessarily in the fashion industry, they also had a lot of insecurities. So starting as a photography project, later on, it became more of a psychological project for me. It became very personal and it expanded to the point that I was actually working and busy with the project for, uh, for the past five years, uh, for, the, for the first five years. The thing is, it was a beautiful project, very important for me and very emotional for me. But it and it opened, like I said in the beginning, a lot of doors and it um, gave me a lot of exposure, but it didn't lead me to get a lot of jobs. And my goal was to work as a photographer because I, I love photography so much and I didn't see any other path and way for me um, for the future. Just I really want to be a photographer and that was the only thing that I could think about. And um, like I said, it gave me a lot of exposure, but it didn't lead to uh, photography jobs. So then I started thinking, what can I do to actually become a commercial or a fashion photographer? Because that was the direction that I wanted to go to. Um, I really, really loved uh, Peter Lindbergh's uh, images since the beginning, the first image that I saw of him. And because I was shooting those portraits in black and white, I decided that I want to start shooting on the streets um, fashion stories in black and white because that was something that I felt comfortable with. Um, the Frecker project also made me a bit, um, to feel a bit more confident about my own skills, which were very poor in the beginning. It was very difficult for me to get to the certain point that I was actually able to say that I can work as a fashion photographer, I can actually work as a photographer. Because um, going from like learning and, and taking portraits from yourself to um, becoming a fashion photographer and actually getting uh, and being booked by clients is just a very, very long way. So I started shooting uh, first some, uh, some very basic projects here in Poland with some of my um, friends from the industry, so stylists, makeup artists and hairstylists. And then I decided that it's the time to start approaching magazines and I built up a post very, very um, basic portfolio from all the images that I shot so far and I approached the Lopisel uh, time and this is the first story that I actually shot having a full letter which is um, basically a letter from the magazine that allows you to shoot a story for them it's like kind of uh, a proof that it's going to be published mm, I created the mood board which was really simple back then I didn't have much experience and when I look at those images now I kind of have a feeling that they are they're pretty simple. I also see some um, stuff that uh, have been done better, um, of course, because this was shot like five, uh, I think four or five years ago and was just the beginning for me. But I mean, I'm never trying to retouch it again or sometimes I look at this selection just to um, maybe have some point for myself for the future. But I mean, this was at the beginning and this is my photography path, so I kind of accepted it. And this was a big start for me. I traveled to New York especially to shoot that story. I remember there's also a funny story about um, this editorial because I had to go to New York for one day. I was really busy at that moment because I have a, had a lot of uh, small commercial jobs here in Poland. And I had to book a flight, which was a transit flight uh, via Ukraine. And something happened with the flight and I couldn't get to the plane that was going to New York. And I was stuck in, a, um, in the airport for like 11 hours. Uh, I arrived to New York at 5 a.m. and then at 8 a.m. I had to be on set already, which was very difficult for me. I do remember that I don't remember the last two clothing um, styling sets in the end. And then I directly after the set I went to the airport and went back to Warsaw. When I woke up in Warsaw, I was so sure that I didn't fly to New York at all. So that was uh, that was impossible. But I think I'm so um, stubborn and I kind of have the feeling that you know there are no boundaries basically and if I really want to do something I will break the walls and do everything to uh, to get it done and this story showed me that I can actually do a lot if I really believe in it. Um, this is another story it was a few months later. Uh, 
I already see in the story, it's still black and white, but the whole story uh, contained two images that were in color as well. Um, I kind of don't like those images because it was my beginning to uh, starting to play with color. It was just a bit difficult for me because I knew that I cannot get a lot of um, jobs for commercial, for commercial clients or more magazines to work with me because I was mainly shooting with black and white. Which is okay, you know, like having your own style and just say like I'm only shooting with black and white. But if you want to work as a fashion photographer and you want to work for the commercial the commercial fashion clients, they will want you to shoot also in color because it's going to be important for them to show the clothing. So if you don't know how to work with color, it might be a bit of a hustle. So I was actually putting myself out of my comfort zone. I was trying and pushing myself to shoot more in color. So this story, I'm, I'm happy about those three images. I'm not really happy about the rest, so I'm showing you this. But then it came to the point that I started uh, forcing myself to actually shoot only in color. And this story for Ella Cossiel at Thailand also was shot again in New York, but with a bit different perspective, with a different a bit of vibe. And the funny thing is that when I heard people commenting about my uh, color photography, they still said, I mean, it's color, but it's still black and white because it's so monochromatic. And I kind of have a feeling that if I'm shooting digital, because now I started to shoot on analog a lot more, um, I kind of have a feeling it's easier for me to shoot color on analog because it's just this whole process, pen printing, and the color looks just so much different. And this post-processing in color was just so difficult for me at that point. But like I said, I was forcing myself and that kind of lead me to um, working for uh, another fashion magazines or for more fashion clients as well. So this was like the, the first real color story that I shot. Then the pandemic came, which was, of course, difficult for, for everyone. Uh, there is no point of uh, comparing for who was uh, a worse or, or, or better. Everyone was in the same situation. But I, I remember that for the first three or four days, I was really scared and shocked and didn't know what to do with it. But after that, I just uh, asked myself a question. What if that would be the normal life right now? And what if like, I will have to find different solutions and what I will have to do to still keep working? Because I want to work as a fashion photographer. And if I'm locked in my own house, it's going to be difficult because I cannot work with models and with the whole team and I don't have a studio. But then I thought that maybe uh, I can transform my own house into a studio. So that was solving my, one of my problems. But then with another problem, I didn't have a model and I didn't have a team. So I called to my friend who's a stylist and I told her um, that I have an idea that I want to create a fashion editor on myself. And those images that you hear, see here, it's me. Uh, and my stylist picked all the clothing from the fashion designers. They made packages and sent it to her to Poznan. She put all the styling sets together and sent it to me to my apartment. Um, I told also the hairstylist who created a week for me. I thought it's going to be more difficult for me to control my camera through my iPhone if I'm going to be have to be having to also uh, control my face and I don't have uh, a lot of experience with the model, so that was a bit difficult. That's why I came up with the idea of the wave. Um, here on the left picture, I'm actually hiding the camera, like hiding my phone, which I was controlling my camera with uh, behind my uh, right leg. On the right image, you see something very strange at first, but then when you look at it for a little bit more time, you see that it's um, a person there as well, and there you see a head over it. So basically, I thought it's going to be a bit difficult for me to find that many poses and to have the editorial um, as good as I want to be, if it's going to be only on a white wall, that it's going to be a bit limiting. So I thought I'm going to use a projector um, because as you know, or maybe you don't, but if you follow my social media, you do you, you know, I not only use right now the Venture monitor, but I also use Thank You uh, projector. And I try to use it uh, not only for uh, my webinars or for, um, sorry, not the webinars, for workshops, but also for my work. And I try to always find new uh, ways to use the equipment. So here I tried to use, uh, I used all the images that I shot in New York uh, of the location when I was location scouting for my shoots. 
and I actually projected them on the white background that gave me, uh, first of all, a lot of light in the night because I uh, I thought I'm going to be shooting this during the day, the whole story, and it's going to be done, but it happened to be very, very difficult. It was probably one of my most difficult shoots I've ever had. Um, and the last uh, few shots that they were uh, shot with the projector, I shot in the night. So the whole shoot probably took like 20 hours. And I remember that after uh, everything was finished and I put the layout together, I was not really happy about the images. And then I called to my team and asked if they can connect with me the next day. And I was even laughing to my team that it was just so nice because, you know, I had the model and I had the whole setup and everything in the house. And if I wanted to, I can do it like again, and you never have this opportunity because when you're coming on set, you have eight, 10 or 12 hours, and then you have to do the job and then it's over. Uh, just to have you give you like a little proof that we actually did it. This is my apartment you see it on the left. So I had um, the screen that I'm using today for the webinar. My whole team was connected with me uh, on Zoom during the whole session. So they were giving me all the tips. Bogdan was on the left bottom, she was giving me all the tips during the set, how I should start the loading. The most difficult part was with the wig because I don't have any experience with like hairstyling, but coming first up what this great hairstylist from Warstone, he was giving me a lot of great advice during the set and he actually helped me um, to style the wig. And you see Coletta on the bottom right, who was actually giving me all the valuable information how I should do my makeup. And we have also Adam on the um, left up corner um, who was helping me with the light a bit and he was helping me with the technical part of the whole shoot. Unfortunately, I didn't have the idea of recording it because it would be nice, of course, to show you, but I didn't do it. Um, so that's me with the wig and on the right you see um, the setup. Uh, so we're in the first room and here we most of the time are doing all the preps. And then there's a second room, which is also pretty big, and uh, we can put easily the backdrop. And like you see, the camera was on the setup, and I was connect. Uh, I connected it to my um, sorry to my phone, and I was able to take the pictures within seconds. Um, we have also some polls during the today's webinar, and I just want to get to know you. It's a bit difficult for me because now I'm looking at my own presentation and I'm talking to the screen. But normally I was used to the fact that when I was hosting those um, online workshops, I had everyone on screen and we could chat. But at least a glimpse that I can actually get to know you guys. If they sense if you could put the first, first poll, which is um, the one on the, about the level of the photography of people uh, are. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So you can uh, press the answer and then I will show you what's the outcome of it. Oh, so many professionals. I feel a bit stressed right now. Okay. I think everyone answered. If you can please uh, show the results. Yeah. So you can understand how stressed I am right now. I hope that you will still enjoy it. So like I told you, uh, I started um, working during the pandemic and of course the project that I just showed you, I created during the major lockdown when we were not able even to almost get out of the house. Um, but then the restrictions were a bit lower and my prepared contract with me, which I was really happy about, it was one of my dreams to shoot there for that magazine. And they asked me to shoot a street story because they really liked the, the stories that I shot uh, in the past. And I was a bit intimidated because I didn't know, uh, first of all, I've never tra uh, traveled to Milan before. So that was the location that I didn't know. And they wanted to shoot in the center of Milan. So it will be like literally, literally visible that it's, uh, uh, it's that location. So we, of course, chose the Duomo. And when I arrived to the location, I was amazed by the fact that there's absolutely no one in the front of Duomo. And I heard from all the crew and from what I've read on the internet that during the day there is a million people in the front and i was so amazed about the fact that they were basically just my models my crew and those pigeons that you see on the picture so that thing had um, actually opened my head a bit about the fact that i really really love to shoot on the street because it's 
like one time opportunity to, that, to take that certain shot and either you're going to take it or you will make a different decision or you will go live it to the left, live it to the right and the image will look totally different because it all depends if someone is going to pass by, if you're going to see the light correctly or if there's going to be cloudy day or if it's going to be sunny day and I mean all those circumstances are so important at the time you take your shot. And the last shot was not actually printed in the magazine, but I really like it because it actually shows the situation that was at that point. I mean, people are in the background wearing masks. And I mean, we shot this during the pandemic. And I was thinking, you know, if I should retouch it or maybe this image is not good. But then I thought, I mean, this is kind of mixed of a fashion and street photography. And I kind of love the fact that people are wearing masks because that was the situation that we were uh, all in. Um, this is like a story for Vanity Fair. Um, I started experimenting more with color and you see here a bit more of a different light. I was always trying to put myself and my subject that I was photographing in a shadow because I felt more um, confident and more calm with it. The whole Frecker story was also shot in a shadow and I didn't want to have a lot of contrast on the face because I wanted to keep the face as natural as possible and I want all the imperfections to be visible as well. So that was something that I felt comfortable with. But then I thought I have to start experimenting a bit more. I'm also a person who gets bored really easily and started, and, and, and like I said, I started experimenting. And this left uh, image, I remember that on set it was a bit of a hustle because the light was really harsh. I think it was almost like the middle of the day. I think it was 1 p.m. Um, we were kind of in, uh, like in the front of the tree, so that was a little bit of a shadow, but still the light was really harsh. But in black and white, I kind of convinced myself that it's still okay. And the right image was taken almost in the last minutes of the light. So the light is still visible there, but it's just really, really soft. Then I came to the point that I started experimenting even more, and that's what I told you about the trends. A lot of photographers started switching to film photography. And I actually, what people don't know, I actually started with film photography back then. I was uh, shooting some 35 millimeter uh, films uh, just for myself, and I really loved it. And that was photography uh, for me in the beginning. And then I thought, working as a fashion photographer, I need to have very good equipment because that's what we think in the beginning that you really have to have a year to deliver amazing images. Plus, I was super scared that if I'm going to come on set and I have um, only film, camera, and something will go wrong because it can easily go wrong, um, then I'm not going to be able to deliver. And it's just such a scary thought. It doesn't matter if it's for a magazine, it doesn't matter if it's even for a test, for a model, and for you. I mean, you're still spending the time to, to do that shoot, to, 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 you know, I mean, the model is still expecting the images, the magazine is expecting the images. So the worst case scenario, uh, is when you're shooting for a client and then you cannot deliver the images. So this was the first story that I decided I'm going to shoot on film. And I remember I shot like few rolls until the half of the shoot. And I was so sure that it was going so wrong that in the middle of the shoot, I said like, okay, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to be shooting digital. I'm too stressed to uh, use analog. And I left it. I didn't, I didn't even develop the rolls. And after some time, the story was already published. I developed the roles and I looked at those, at those images. And honestly, I like those images a lot more than uh, the, the, the ones that I actually turned up from the digital camera. Uh, on the left, you see the scan from Mamiya IGS 67, and on the right, you see the handprint. So I actually decided to really spend a lot of time in the dark room, and I had a great teacher. And I think it took me like nine months uh, to start understanding uh, the camera, understanding the color. I think that I started understanding color when I started uh, hand printing in the darkroom, which is also something like a major um, turn for me. Then putting all this together, I thought, I mean, I thought a story on myself in a home studio. And I started shooting a lot more and using this space, especially that we still were in a kind of a lockdown. And I created two stories for Pop Russia. The left one was actually pure test for me and my first uh, Mamiya shot after the editorial that you just saw. So I had some break and I had to 
brief and get home with it. And then I decided I'm going to shoot a beauty story. I thought it's going to be easier for me to give it a second chance shooting a beauty story when I have uh, such a confidence shooting portraits. So we did this in my own house with my own equipment, with my whole team. Uh, and thanks to that, I also felt you know, comfortable and I was not stressed and I didn't have a magazine on the back of my head so I could really easily uh, get, you know, like just the images that I wanted and I felt. And I sent it to the editor of uh, Vogue Russia and she loved it and she published it on uh, Vogue Russia webpage and I was really, really happy about it. And then we started collaborating, that's how our collaboration started. And then I received the full letter from her and I created the right story. Um, especially for uh, for Vogue Russia. I'm going to show you later the mood board and how I created the story because I think it's also very uh, fun to look at how I was thinking about those images beforehand and how they turned out. And that will also show you like um, the second part of our webinar, which is like how to get inspired. Uh, if uh, Vincente, I can ask you to put another poll, which is um, about film photography and digital. Yes, happily. By the way, Agatha, we've, uh, I don't know if you have a microphone. Some people have been saying that they love your apartment, but there's sadly a bit of echo. Would yeah, have, I don't have a microphone. Have... I'm trying ah, okay. to talk slow and try to talk louder. That's no problem. <laughs> Sorry about that. But I'm happy you guys like the apartment. So I think almost everyone responded, they can share the results. I see that clear, clearly most of the people should digital, which is like I even wrote myself, more re relevant to fashion and commercial photography, which I absolutely agree. Until that point, I'm still shooting digital and film, which is like kind of difficult. And my team is always saying that basically I'm shooting two or three different story, stories during the set, and it's a hustle, but I mean, those images that actually turned out good from Mamiya are amazing. And I'm going to also show you the comparison when I'm going to show you my year. I'm happy that some like 8% shoot only on film and 17 are starting. It's a great, great adventure. So I keep my fingers crossed. Um, if now, uh, Vincent, you can show um, the TikTok I created about my apartment. Gladly, one moment. So like I told you, I started creating content for TikTok. It's a bit of a hustle, but I'm at least trying. This is the one that I kind of accepted that exists. So basically you will see my apartment and how it's turning into a studio. Before I begin the video, uh, Agatha's already explained, but I, I, this is a very short video from, from Agatha's social media, but I think it's quite, it's quite astonishing how a space can be transformed and be turned into really a professional magazine cover. It's, it's, it's really astonishing. This is my apartment that works well also as a photography studio. And this is a BDS of my recent story for Vogue Russia. Hope you will like it. So yeah, I, a, sh a short video, but it, I, I think it really goes to show just how, how far one, how far a space can make, how far the right gear can make and, and having the right team. And I, I think that's really something that Agatha is fantastic with is transforming any space really into a really a professional setting for a, for a, for a photo shoot. I think you see my screen. Oh my God, I heard my own voice. That was terrible. I try not to look my phone, look at my content myself, but okay. Um, so getting all this information together, me shooting on the street, me wanting to start shooting in a studio and knowing the fact that, 
you know, we have different seasons and there's a lot of clients and customers that they still need to have content created in the studio. That's why I started working more on my studio portfolio to be able to approach different clients. And by keeping up with trends, I don't necessarily mean like keeping up with fashion trends, but with what is happening in the fashion industry. You know, like clothing styles are of course changing during the seasons and we have different seasons. And of course the fashion clients do need like two, three campaigns each year and two, three lookbooks each year. And the clothing is changing, but I mean, the style of photography changes as well. And when you have different um, fashion shows, like for the end of this year, there was a lot of fashion shows created on the street. So I instantly had a lot of uh, propositions from clients to shoot fashion uh, editorials or fashion campaigns on the streets for them. And that's how the industry changes. So you have to uh, kind of react to that because I'm honestly not really following the fashion trends. I have my stylist uh, for this and that's really easy for me because I'm really bad at clothing. Um, but at least I know what is happening in the fashion industry. We shot this story a few months ago for La Pisil Argentina. And for them, we're shooting always like for different seasons that we have uh, in Europe. So it's a bit of a hustle. And we have to always well prepared also, um, you know, for the season uh, ahead. So for the season up front. So you have to also keep that in mind. And also working for the magazines means that you have to also remember what kind of style of the magazine they have and what kind of images that they're using. Um, that all leads me actually to the fact that I started working more for commercial clients. That's why I told you that it's very important to. Um, get out of your comfort zone, try different things and, you know, have very variety in your portfolio. Some of the work that I have shot for commercial clients, not all of the work I show on my social media, because you don't have to show it. You can show only what you're comfortable with, but sometimes, you know, the client want, want to have a different content and that's, I, in my personal opinion, absolutely fine to create. This is a commercial campaign for celebrity. It's a Polish brand of Italian uh, garments um, and we created in the studio, we have uh, just the studio space in, uh, in the, behind the model. It was not shot in my home studio because it was more difficult and we needed a lot more space, uh, but I think it's also uh, pretty okay. We only used artificial light, but we had also a big team working on the light, which was also very handy for me, sometimes difficult to when you have a lot of equipment and we were shooting also on Mamiya, so we were shooting digital uh, analog and which was a lot of work for me. So I couldn't set up the lights also myself because that would be almost uh, impossible. This is my recent campaign for Modiva. Uh, it's also a totally different vibe than I normally should, but I try to find something that will be also uh, as a technical part. And this is not done in post-production, but actually this image is almost uh, almost raw. Like I only cleaned a little bit of the skin and I took care of like some, some hair and cleaned the clothing a bit. But I mean, this uh, double model is taken uh, on camera using a prism. Um, this is a recent campaign for Kazar also Stasha Tokowska. Me going back, on, uh, back to the streets again, trying to find different ways to photograph. Normally, this is street, but I was thinking about this story as more geometrical. That's why I was actually shooting from above and trying to find those elements that will actually make the, um, the model pop from the picture and that we will see uh, what is the most important. So the person itself, but also the, not the clothing, but the bags, because uh, Kazari is a bag uh, company and they have uh, shoes and bags. Um, all to the point that I actually started convincing my clients to uh, allow me to shoot on film. This is the hand print done in the studio. There is almost none, post, not post, uh, no retouched later on. I mean, the colors are exact, uh, same as the scan. But the thing is like, you know, it doesn't matter uh, if it comes to the digital or if it comes to uh, analog photography, it all ends being digitalized. Now here is my recent story for Rob Russia. On the left, you see a hand print and on the right is a digital uh, photo. I will show you why I chose different gear for those particular shots in a second. Um, yeah, so is the equipment really that important? Um, I have to quickly check what kind of holes we get. I'm so sorry. 
Um, Vincenta, could you please tell me what the polls we have? Because I think we should put another one right now. Yeah, we have the one about what to use for, for photo editing. Um, yeah. I got a one point. If you if you perhaps have even I don't know iPhone microphone or maybe there's a room with with less echo. Uh, everyone's really really enjoying the content and during the rehearsal we actually didn't have any issues with echoes. But maybe it has something to do with the position. Uh, if you have, okay. if, if that's I possible. I moved a bit closer. Is that okay now? Yeah, I. Th I, th I think it's I think it's more or less the same. If you have uh, you, you you can take you can if you have it in the house you can take a few minutes to to to, to go get it or maybe there's a a different room perhaps. I have to apologize to the people people at home. Everyone's really really enjoying the the webinar, but some people are having a bit of trouble hearing because of the Sorry. echo. Uh, maybe I can try with uh, AirPods, but you have to give me two minutes. No, that's totally fine. That's totally fine. Take your time. So. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> no worries, no worries. So while Agatha is setting that up, let's have a bit of a look at this. 34% uh, of you are using professional monitors, which I think is, is really, really cool. 20% uh, of using non-photography monitors. 43% of you, the majority, is using laptops. And you know, it's, it's funny, I often put the option with the cell phone there, almost out of curiosity, and it's interesting to see that 4% of you also use the, the cell phone as an editing, as an editing tool. Uh, I've been working now at BenQ for about four years uh, with a lot of different artists, and it's it's really quite interesting getting this kind of feedback because we often, uh, I think often the monitor is often seen as almost like a secondary tier in terms of the equipment, in terms of how important it is for the uh, for the photographer, but really getting the honest feedback from the photographers, from the designers that I've worked with. They always speak about this big leap that they feel in quality, this big change that they feel now in how and how they get to work. Um, and even one one very funny piece of feedback we got is that someone who had previously been working on a non BenQ monitor, when she switched to BenQ, she said actually what she liked the most was the matte coating because the the screen was not reflective anymore and she could work pretty much in any time time of day. So. It's really quite fascinating getting the getting the different uh, getting the different types of feedback, and uh, I'll take advantage here a bit of the situation as well uh, to talk a bit more. Uh, one one example I can uh, I can actually give was um, if any of you use Photoshop, which I imagine a lot of you do, we had one bit of feedback which was really uh, which was really interesting. Uh, Flora Borsi. If we have any Hungarians here, please let me know in the comments. If you know Flora Borsi, Borsi uh, Flora Borsi is a very, very talented uh, designer from uh, from Hungary who works a lot with self-portraits. And she's been working with BenQ for a couple of years. And she actually says that one of the, she was the one who gave that feedback that she had a monitor before, which is very glossy, means that it was very reflective. So if there was sunlight coming or a light like I have right now shining, uh, she really couldn't work, and she had to close the curtains every time she uh, every time she was working in the daytime. But and she could only work in the nighttime. And so when she switched over to BenQ, she said that was really a fantastic transition for her, and that was something that she was not even looking looking for, so to speak. But the fact that the matte coating was there was something that really helped her with the um, uh, was something that really helped her with the with the reflection. I'm seeing here that Andras, I'm hoping, hope I'm saying that correctly, is from Hungary. That's very cool. Uh, I'll send you, Andras, later the, the, the profile for Flora. Flora. I think you'll, you'll really quite like that. And um, in my work, it's been really fascinating because it's about 10 or 15 different countries that we uh, that I work with here in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and it's really fascinating. 
fascinating to see people, designers and photographers from all different walks of life. We have people that work with 3D design, with automotive design, uh, some with, uh, which work with portrait photography. If some of you have gone to the, come to the, the other webinars we've had in the past, it's uh, it's always really fascinating to see all these different backgrounds that come to uh, that come to BenQ and the different people that we get to work with. Uh, one other thing that I that I want that I also want to mention, since I have here the the, the time to use it, is that um, whether you're just starting with design and photography, or whether you're someone who's working working very high end with this, there really is a monitor for you throughout the whole uh, throughout the whole range. And um, no matter the resolution you're looking for, or the or the uh, or the size you're looking for, whether it's 24 inch or all the way up to 32 inch, like what Agatha is using. There really is a monitor built in mind for you. Uh, the the higher resolutions, uh, some people, some photographers actually almost prefer to uh, actually almost prefer to work with a work with a smaller smaller resolution. Uh, we actually have next week a webinar with Samuel Chikluna. Uh, Samuel is a is a photographer from Malta, and uh, that was actually a funny bit of feedback that he gave us, which was surprising, which is that he actually received a 2K monitor, which is the SW270C. And that was one of his pieces of feedback, is that when he started to work with that, he actually liked the fact that there, uh, the resolution wasn't so high. It felt it was the right size, the right amount of resolution that he had for, uh, for, his, uh, for his screen size. And... Uh, I can check with Agatha. How is the sound? Well, you tell me. Is it okay now? <laughs> Does that sound better for everyone? Well, I don't hear you that well anymore because I have uh, JBL headphones and I see an echo, so it's a bit difficult for me, but I can manage. In but just tell me if I, you hear me better or if it's worse. So I'm getting some feedback here already. One moment. I'm Much so better, sorry, better, Gary. better. I'm, so uh, <laughs> I'm happy because I feel so bad now. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. So j just so everyone knows, we of course we rehearse every single we rehearse every single webinar we do. Of course, since uh, we had no issues with the audio before, so it's we we of course want you to be enjoying the webinar to its to its fullest potential here. Um, but it seems that that seems to be. That seems to be generally better. So, Agatha, I'll hand it off back to you. Okay. So, is the equipment really that important? I guess this is the apartment. It's a bit a lot of space right now. So, and whatever. I'm so sorry about it. I hope that it's okay now. Um, okay, so is the equipment really that important? Like I told you in the beginning, well, before, um, equipment for me is just something that I use to take a part of particular shot, but I don't pay that much attention to it. The Freckles Project, as many of the people who attended my web work workshops before, they know that I actually shot this image with Canon 60 and 40 millimeter 2.8 lens from Canon. And the whole uh, project was actually shot with that lens, and not only because I, I don't know, I think this lens is the best lens in the world, but it's just a tank lens, it's very small, and it actually is, of course, um, wide angle, so it's forcing me to come closer to the person that I'm photographing. And it actually cuts the distance, because there's nothing uh, more difficult in creating that connection, and for me, Make, uh, taking a portrait is basically based on the connection of the person that I'm photographing. Uh, Santa, I'm sorry because I'm showing that the main screen is showing right now something different that I see on the screen. Uh huh. You okay. should be you should be the one who's presenting right now. Can you can you control it still? It's I see the freckles project right now. Okay, great. Because in a miniature it shows something different. Doesn't matter. I'm sorry because I'm really stressed right now about technical issues and that's why. Um. Okay. So. It actually cuts the distance, and that's the most important thing for me. And like I said, there's nothing uh, more unnatural between two people trying to get uh, intimate together in a photography way, uh, having something plastic in between. And especially, I know that you know a lot of people are the opinion that you have to have like 
50 or 85 or even 100 millimeter uh, lens to get a great portrait. But for me, it just doesn't work. It basically, I'm, I'm too far away from the person that I'm photographing. It, it gives me a lot of distance. I cannot uh, get that close to the person I'm photographing, and it just is more difficult for me. So I'm actually choosing the equipment that is going to be allowing me to shoot in a better way, not allowing me to actually that uh, give me that certain look at that image. I know it's hard to understand at first, but I'm, when I'm going to show you as a comparison in a second, then you will uh, probably get it. And the best way to, to see the comparison is to just look at the three different images from uh, Bob Russia, my recent story of the editorial that I shot. And I used three different cameras. So I used, uh, I used Mamiya S67, I used Canon, and I used Graflex. Graflex has, I'm going to show you. So this is a camera that I'm using to shoot um, a Fuji F300C. Um, they're not producing them anymore, which is very sad. I'm really sad about it. Uh, I was happy enough to buy a lot of stash and a lot, a lot of Fuji packs when they were still selling them. And actually, one day before they announced that they're going to stop producing them, I actually transformed this camera to a Polaroid, so it has a special bag. And you can take a horizontal and vertical image, which is also really handy. And it gives a special, special uh, look to the image. I mean. Fuji is amazing because you have a negative and a positive, and you can clean the negative, and then you can make a handprint out of the uh, the negative itself. But it's very difficult. I've tried it once, and it's very time consuming because you have, you have to first clean it, obviously, and then you have to um, prepare it in the dark room and then do the handprint. And the colors are very difficult, especially that this is the expired film, so I'm only using the positives right now, but the effect is amazing. And I tried to take that certain shot with the Canon and with the Mamiya, but I couldn't get the same vibe that I wanted. And it was just only the Polaroid that was looking how I wanted to look. With the handprint, with the Mamiya RZ67 scan, uh, it's easier for me to get something that it's still, because I'm still not that used to shoot on film, and it's still a bit difficult for me. It took me nine months to actually convince myself that I want to shoot on film, but it's still quite beginning. So when I was shooting a portrait, it's kind of easy. I can actually have the time to focus well, to place my model in the right position, to actually think about how I want to take the shot. And that's why the close portrait was really easy for me to take. But when I was trying to take that shot with the cannon uh, that is in the middle, it was just a bit difficult. So let's look at the uh, scan and the handprint first. So you see the scan on the left and then the handprint on the right. Um, like I told you in a, like a, a, a bit before, I started understanding color when I started doing handprints, and that's like kind of a proof of it. The scan I was trying to get into a color that I wanted, but it was still a bit cold. It's just because I'm so used to black and white photography and this monochromatic look in color photography that I'm still struggling to find that right balance. And with handprints and with like putting the right colors in dark room, it's somehow easier for me. It's kind of weird, but I kind of feel better. And I started understanding it in a way that I was actually trying to copy it later in Photoshop on the screen, on the monitor, and it was just easier for me because I already saw the handprint, so I was understanding it, how it might look, and I was trying to copy it as well. So it gave me also a lot of different uh, ways to try to uh, retouch it later. This is the exact shot that I told you about. I was trying to get what I wanted on Mamiya, but I kind of had the feeling that I'm not going to get it because I was trying to get like frozen emotion and it was just a bit difficult because when I was trying to focus, we were on a very small balcony when I don't really have the space to work. And it was just a bit difficult for me to even move around. And I would take that shot from the bottom, which is kind of my thing as well, like shooting from the bottom. And I knew instantly that from those shots, I'm going to have a better portrait and close up the one that you've seen before, instead of like trying to force myself and do like, I don't know, like 20 or 30 rolls and still not get the shot I wanted. And kind of was just easier here. So the equipment, like I told you, for me, is just there to make it easier for me so I can actually do, uh, to take those frames that I uh, want to take. And here you have two uh, examples of uh, the Polaroids, the scan of the Polaroids. I took all th those two shots with Mamiya and Hanna, but there is something with a Polaroid, like with the softness of it and with the plasticity, that you, you cannot 
compared to anything else. And those push shots I find a lot better on the uh, Fuji Polaroid and I'm not afraid to use it as well. And of course, like I told you also before, it doesn't matter if you're shooting on digital or you're shooting on analog, it all ends up just digitalizing it. So if I think I'm shooting, if I'm shooting on digital right after this set, of course I'm doing the backup and then I'm doing the selection and I'm uh, doing the post-production and then showcasing the images on social media or, or, or delivering the images to the client. If it comes to Mamiya, I'm scanning the negatives, uh, scanning the, uh, developing the roles, scanning the negatives, then uh, hand printing in the studio, then I have to scan it again. Um, so when you have it on my computer, then it probably, you know, for the fetch clients, you still have to retouch them a bit. Um, for your personal projects, you don't have to obviously, if you're happy with the hand print itself. And then you can um, make the publication out of it. So it all ends up like using the, the monitor. And now we're having a webinar for BenQ and I'm happy to work with BenQ for over one and a half year. And it was also a major change for me with my post-production routine. It's a lot easier and I enjoy it so much and enjoy it much, much better. And my adventure with color actually started when I had a good monitor because honestly, and you know this for yourself, if you have a bad monitor and that happens also with clients when you deliver the images and they think like, oh, this is a bit too much CN. I mean, this is difficult for them because they have different screens and my screen's uh, exactly calibrated for printing. So it's very easy for me. I can print the images and then I can see how they look and how they will look when they're going to be printing them in the magazine. So this is also an important um, important part of my uh, research routine. I also uh, prepared the print that you, uh, you've seen before. So this is this one. This is the print that I have done myself for Russia and then it was scanned and then I literally retouched only a bit of skin just to clean the spots and then it was ready for publication. And here are some Polaroids from the set. So I'm shooting also with a 670, but this is just for my personal work and my personal uh, portfolio. But the Mamiya, I mean, we use a lot of Mamiya scans for publication as well. And this is not, for instance, this one is 8 on 10 and it's pretty cool. I like it. Too bad that they're not producing them anymore. Um, how Vixen uh, also said that you have a special discount. Um, and one of my images on the right from a box store, and I'm going to show you in a second because I'm going to show you also how I'm creating the boards. Um, this whole story was also retouched on a uh, banking monitor, so you can scan it and you can use the discount. I have highly recommend it. So, creative workflow and how to prepare and where to find inspirations is just always the question that people ask. It's a very difficult question to myself. That's why I always uh, prefer to put it in the presentation because it's very hard for me to answer. Because I know that a lot of photographers, it's easy for them to say that they get inspired by movies or books or anything else. For me, it's very difficult. When I'm focused on a movie, I'm basically watching a movie and it's very difficult for me to uh, get inspired. And I've never had a situation that I said like, oh, okay, now I know what I want to shoot. I'm getting inspired by other images and I'm not afraid to say it. It's not like I'm always, I'm never trying to copy someone else's work and I'm going to show you in a second how that looks like. But it basically starts something in my brain that I actually have some comparisons or have some memories or it kind of triggers something that I want to shoot later on. Um, the second thing that gets me inspired is people around me. I sometimes get inspired by a person that I want to photograph and then instantly I have some idea in my, have, in my head that I want to shoot that, uh, in that certain way. So I want to tell you how I was preparing for a book rush shoot, the second story, uh, the one with the flowers. So that's how my mood board starts. So this is the first page with the book and with my logo. And then we have the generic mood board. And on the generic mood board, I basically put some images that give the mood, but not instantly the frames or not instantly the line that we're going to use. Just something that gives me kind of a direction how I want the, the story to um, to be seen. Then I'm actually putting the concept uh, in like one page. So when we see this image, it's basically okay. So it's shot in the studio. 
we're gonna do some flowers, it's gonna be moody, and it's gonna be a harsh light. That's what I see. And I put some key points on the presentation because I send it to my team so that it's gonna be easier for them also to um, get to the point that they will be all knowing what they have to prepare and how they have to prepare for the shoot. So we know that the shoot is gonna be inspired by flowers, it's gonna be strong but kind of soft light because the light is visible in that picture, but it's not soft. Modi expression, uh, expressions one strong leading color. That's something that is kind of normal for me because I always choose one strong leading color. Uh, I wanted to have wet makeup with wet hair. It didn't went that direction, but I'm going to show you that in a second. What I wanted to do was to use backlight because I've never used it before. And like I, like you probably know, I like to get out of the comfort zone. And you know each time that I'm shooting with my team and I feel comfortable, I try to shoot something different just to learn something and just to have a totally different vibe on set. That's also very important for me because I remember that moment that I was shooting all the time on the street and I was getting not even bored, but it was just so used to, uh, so, so easy for me and not easy in a way that it was just so amazing because I'm never, I'm never saying about my own work like that, but it just, it was just, you know, like you're going every day to work and you're doing the same thing. I kind of felt like that. That's why I started shooting in a studio. That's why I swapped the equipment to analog, just to be constantly learning and constantly changing. That still keeps you going and wanting to create. Um, and of course, because we were shooting a book and I felt comfortable with my team, I wanted to do handprints and I really wanted to shoot some polaroids as well. Then I put two pictures that will actually kind of describe the light that I want to use. The right one is the backlight that I want to have. On the left, you still have the backlight, but it's, the light is a bit more harsh. And this two directions I wanted to go, but I chose to um, give that um, decision to my uh, lighting assistant because he also has to tell me if something is possible, impossible, difficult to change, or we have to um order different equipment or is it something that we can actually do with the equipment that we have that is all something that we have to prepare also before and this is something that i know not a lot of photographers do i have to put, lay put layouts together beforehand and i know it's kind of strange for you to look at that at first because those are the images from other photographers but it's not about like i want to shoot that frame and i want it to look this way it just gives me an idea of like how all the images are gonna look in the publication and what kind of frames I have to take to make the story complete. Because if you will have like only full frames or only portraits, you will not be able to take put the story together. You will have to start cropping. And I'm still of the opinion that it's better to get everything on camera and I always try to do it. So when I have this idea on how I want the story to look, it's easier for me to shoot on set. And then I'm putting the frames together. So the left image was like my ideal frame, like how I wanted it to look. And then the right image as the final image. So it was going to be about the frontal portrait or the back side. I wanted to have a strong expression, but with that kind of um, makeup, let's say makeup because it's a beauty story, it didn't work well. It looked a bit too aggressive. And I thought it's going to be nicer when it's just going to be such a calm picture. Um, and I wanted to, and during the set, I decided that I want to have a tighter crop. And my first idea was to have a color accent with makeup, but then during the set, I decided that the color makeup here is not going to work because it's going to be too much. And then the color accent that I wanted to achieve in that frame was actually with those little flowers on the face. The second frame was about an American cup, uh, cut. Makeup, no makeup, with sweat skin. That actually kind of worked well. Uh, I wanted to have a backlight, but because we didn't have a lot of Power with light. I couldn't shoot uh, those Fuji FB100C uh, graphics Polaroids, so I decided to use the very strong light with the high mean the uh, artificial light on those frames from Polaroid. And I wanted to have a strong sleep hair, and that kind of worked well. I remember that on this shot we had a problem because what I had, the first idea I had in my head was just to have the flowers underneath the foil. But it was just so difficult for us to find the good frame and the flowers were falling and we just saw the people that I was not able to focus. Uh, and out of frustration, I think I just started peeling those little flowers um, off um, and I put uh, and I placed them underneath the foil and that was the shot. We just 
took the shot within a minute, within a minute, and we were struggling and hustling uh, with taking that shot for a longer time before. And then the frame three, American cut flower scenography. Like on the left image, you see that the flowers are kind of the part of the model, and I wanted to show it in a totally different way. I want them to be in a different perspective, and so they, they will be like covering the model, like she's still not in the studio, but somewhere else. And of course, I wanted to have a backlight, but like I told you, that has changed. So you see that I'm trying to put the frames, like the pictures are totally different, but it kind of gave me the direction, the direction on set because I remember when I was starting and I was on um, fashion shoots, it was just so difficult for me when you have this moment that, okay, you are after three sets and then you're out of your creative um, ideas for another frame and then you're getting stressed and you don't know what to do next. That's why we have this mood board and most of the time I don't even look at it anymore because I know it in my head and I know what I want, want, to, want to shoot, but that actually um, creating those mood boards and working with those mood boards actually helped me to lead that to, to the point that I'm actually knowing perfectly what I'm doing on set. So that was a great lesson. So going back to the mood board for a second and then the final end result. Like it's totally different vibe. It's a lot of yellow, a lot of like creamy colors and that's how I want it to look. But I mean, that's the point. I mean, you're getting inspired, you're creating the story in your head, but it's not something as people can say is a copy because it's a totally different story. Thank you so much. Um, so it's the end of the content. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and I hope you heard me as the most important thing now. Um, Vincenta, could you please? Uh, yeah, hi. Hi everyone. So just to be clear, the webinar itself is not over yet. Don't worry. The content is, but now we're going to get into the juicy part, which is when you get to ask all of your questions to Agatha. And uh, before we go into the Q&A, uh, I just wanted to emphasize uh, before we get into that, that the 10% the discount code that we mentioned before will be sent to you. So that's along with the recording of today's webinar will be going to you tomorrow. So in about 24 hours time. And uh, for those of you who, um, who do have questions to Agatha, if you already ask something, she might not see it right now, but of course you can feel free to ask that, ask that right now. And uh, yeah, uh, for, I'm gonna put up the screen for you, the discount code for those of you who already want to see it. You'll also be receiving it in tomorrow's, uh, in tomorrow's email. One moment. We've already been getting a lot of really interesting questions for Agatha. It's really exciting to see the really exciting to see the, the engagement. So you should be seeing that right now. So yeah, this is, uh, like I said, this is for Europe. So not just for Poland, of course, where, where Agatha is from, but really for uh, for all of Europe. And the code that you can see below is the BANQ4AS 2021. This will be valid for, for one month within Europe. And you can then check that out uh, within this month to then, to then check out. And uh, I believe Agatha right, right now is grabbing a, a glass of water, but I'm already seeing a lot of really interesting questions being submitted here. A lot of really, really cool stuff. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to the questions right now. I've deleted some uh, bad audio comments, so it's easier for me to read them. Um, so there is one. It don't get. Uh, film gets more publicity than digital. Do you notice pattern or there is no difference? Well, 
at the beginning people were not like the clients were not really confident in allowing me to shoot um film photography for their commercial work so that was a hustle in the beginning because they were scared basically that if something gets, goes wrong then they will not have the content that they uh, pay for and um i kind of have the feeling and a lot of photographers swap to film lately and i kind of have the feeling that this is kind of the new way in photography and i'm personally very happy about the switch so I still am the opinion of uh, I'm still of the opinion that if you're creating great images, it doesn't matter if you should film or, or digital. And I don't personally see that much of a difference in my like, clients right now. I hope that will change because I'm trying to convince a lot of my clients to allow me to shoot on film. Let me check another one. I started with film photography in high school 15 years ago, then transitioned into digital. Recently, I wanted to reignite my photography and invested in Mamiya as a 67. I'm finding difficulties balancing the two. Obviously, there are props and cons for both. What is the take on digital versus analog? Um, well, the thing is, like, that's what I showed you also. I hope I, I actually think that maybe that was the uh, question asked before I actually got into the part of. Uh, me explaining the differences between Mamiya and the Canon. Well, like that's what I told you during the webinar that for me, it doesn't really matter. I just wanted to have the shot that I want to take. And if Mamiya, Mamiya is better for that certain shot, I will choose Mamiya. And I still feel, kind of have the feeling that it's so nice to look at those analog images. And it just gives me so much joy to create those handprints. And I kind of have the feeling that it's more me and more more of the photographer's job there than with the digital, but you know, it's just something that you feel more comfortable with, I, I believe. Someone is shooting uh, both digital and film. Agatha, if you don't, I'm not, I, at least I can't see you, maybe your webcam is not on. Yeah, because it's easier for me because then I can see the questions. Do I have to, should I put it on? Uh, well, you don't have to. I, I, I think we'd all like to, uh, like to see you, of course, if, if, that, if that works. Is it okay now? Yeah, that's good, yeah. Yes, my eyes are really bad, so I have to like come really close to the computer to see the questions. Tell her, tell her not to be stressed. Thank you so much. Um, how did you get to work with magazines like Vogue and Vanity Fair? So uh, with Vanity Fair, I was actually really surprised because the stylist from Vanity Fair was following me on Instagram and she just approached me, she sent me an email if I'm interested to work with Vanity Fair. And I was super stressed and super happy that she uh, she approached me. Uh, and I said, yes, of course. And I was actually kind of not even knowing that people like, you know, stylists from Vanity Fair following me on Instagram. So it's a great opportunity for you guys to actually showcase your work, whatever you can. And I know that a lot of people were laughing about TikTok in the beginning, but you know, TikTok is also changing and I have a lot of faith in it. And um, I actually showed a recent campaign and during the set, they told me that they actually found my work via TikTok, which kind of surprised me, but also very nice because it kind of showed that, you know, it's good to be there as well. Um, when Agatha shoots her models in studio and on location, does she get uh, shots with color checker passport to ensure the fashion colors match exactly to the clothes being featured? So guys, this is the, the kind of a funny thing because I'm not really a technical photographer. And I I assure you that I'm per per perfectly aware about the fact that the clothes have to have the same color as they are, uh, as they have, and they have to have the same color on uh on the pictures but the thing is like i use only color checking once at the photography school like i never i never use it i kind of have maybe a good feeling of it during the set and i kind of remember how they should look sometimes but very maybe it happened once it happened once before uh that the client sent me um uh, you know the exact color uh in the pantheon about one dress because it was a bit different from uh how it normally looks it was a bit different in the picture and then I corrected it and that's it. But I mean, I know that it's a great way to keep the colors uh, exactly the same. Mm. Do you have any tips on how to take the first steps as a fashion photographer, especially on how to find models and stylists, clothes, to start building your portfolio? Uh, 
question from Kim. Hi, Kim. Uh, thank you so much. This is a very important question, actually, and a lot of people ask me uh, how to how to start in fashion uh, industry, and it's a, actually a bit hard because for a fashion photographer, I mean, if you want to get published, you have to have good quality clothes. I mean, high end brands, which is hard to get if you don't have a pool letter. You're not going to get a pool letter from the magazine if you don't have good quality work. And it's basically a very tight circle and it's very hard to, uh, hard to get there. It was very hard to get there actually those eight years ago when I was starting. Right now it's a bit easier because it's really, I truly believe that right now it's more about the photography content that you're creating. And a lot of, um, people are just showcasing their work via Instagram, um, TikTok and Facebook. And really, you never know who's following and who will actually look at your images. So for me, personally, when I'm traveling to a country that I don't know anyone and I'm actually doing a photography job there and I want to shoot my own personal work, I'm actually approaching people on Instagram. This is the best way. And I'm using also hashtags. There are also some applications. I don't remember the application name right now. If you will be interested, please um, DM me on Instagram. I'm going to check it on my phone. Uh, it's an application that you can actually place uh, casting for your shoot uh, in certain locations. And then you can casting not only models, but also the whole team. Uh, and it's a very good application. Uh, it, uh, the application works really well in the US. This is a Interesting one. Does Agatha choose even this to submit for commissioned work or does she submit all shots for her photo editor to select from? Um, most of the magazines, uh, most of the editors, they are choosing the images, the final images from the selection I send them. But there are some magazines like my relationship with Bob Russia or with Al Official Thailand is very, very good. And I basically deliver them the whole package with the final images. So I'm actually putting the layout together and sending them the final work. And I'm really happy about it because then, you know, I'm really confident about the work that I'm, uh, I'm showing, sending them. And I'm also, you know, confident about showing this in my portfolio as well. Because sometimes, you know, when you're on set and you're shooting, um, and, and, and you're in the mood, you're with the team, you have the whole people involved and you have a certain feeling on set, it just so, uh, so different from what can person see from the selection. I mean, the, the story can look totally different. And of course, it's acceptable. I kind of accepted uh, this kind of uh, work, working balance through the years. But I mean, I, I'm really happy about the relationship that I have with uh, at least like Vogue Russia, who actually gets the work how I how I send them and publishes the work that how I send them. Oh my God, so many questions. Uh, what should we do after we build, uh, we have built a portfolio? How to get into fashion industry or work with various brands? There are two different ways. I mean, we can uh, of course wait until they will uh, approach you, which is kind of hard because you will never know if they will approach you or if they won't, obviously. But I actually, when I was in the beginning, I was actually approaching clients, not telling them that I want to shoot the story for them, but Hi guys, this is my portfolio. I love your brand. I kind of uh, have a feeling that we will be a good match, and that it's also a great way to approach them, just to show the uh, show them your portfolio and just to show them basically your work, so you can give them an idea and maybe they will consider you for the future. Um, <laughs> Thank you for such a very helpful webinar. My question for Agata is how do you stay creative in lighting and image in the studio? And do you think it's healthy to keep coming back to a certain favorite light setup repeatedly? Um, I started with natural light. So natural light is always the easiest and the most confident for me. I started experimenting with uh, artificial light kind of like last year and trying to master it this year, but still when there's something a bit more difficult and I know how the images, uh, I know how I want images to look like, I hire a lighting assistant who's a lot more experienced than me and actually helps me to put the light. And that is also a very good lesson, it's said, because I'm learning so much from all those people. You know, I kind of have the feeling that all the people on set, they should do 
their job. I mean, I'm the photographer to so take the pictures. I kind of have the feeling that I should know about the light at least a bit, but it's the same with the stylist. I mean, I have some knowledge and I know what I kind of prefer on shoot, on shoot styling wise, but I'm not a stylist. So the stylist has to prepare the styling and if she is confident that something is going to look better and it's going to be better for the story, I trust them. And this is the same with the light. So I have some knowledge and I can do some some stuff and I know all of the equipment that I have because I'm working with ground color equipment mainly. But if there is something uh, very difficult and we have to light uh, the bigger set, it's just more difficult for me. And of course, it's time consuming also on set that I have to focus on different stuff so that I have a lighting assistant who helps out. What's the technique or key role of shooting images on the streets? How do you ensure that they come out sharp? Is this achieving in post-processing? Well, there's not a lot of post-processing in my uh, street photography. The story that I shot for LFTL uh, is pretty raw. I'm more working in, with dodge and burn in Photoshop, so I'm trying to work with shadows and lights. And that's kind of easy for me. I'm, I'm using the uh, Vacom tablet. I used to uh, retouch with the mouse, sorry, it's like talking for two hours right now. Um, I used to retouch with the mouse, right now I'm retouching only on the Vacom tablet and it's uh, a lot more confident, but it's still, it's kind of like drawing for me. I'm actually drawing since I was a kid and it's just easier for me to see the shadows and lights. And that's how I started retouching the images, the black and white images. Uh, and about the sharpness of the images, well, I'm moving a lot during the set, and I'm, uh, that's why I'm also um, using the tablet on set. And I'm connecting the tablet to the camera via the app that I have on this uh, iPad, which is not, uh, it's, which is a little bit more easy for me to use on a location itself because I don't have a table and I still can check if the images are sharp. And if it's not sharp, I'm still trying to take more shots to have uh, the best quality. But I kind of have the feeling that the sharpness of the image just nowadays is not really that important as just uh, the vibe of it. And if you can um, kind of convince the viewer or kind of convince the magazine that this story how sh uh, should look like this, I mean, it's still okay. The story that I showed, the first story that I showed you that I didn't develop the role because I was not confident enough about how it's uh, going to turn out. This story was mainly about unsharp images. There are three photos in the story that I are totally out of focus and I did it on purpose. So if you can win this story by having those unsharp images, that's fine as well. How do you find models and do you ask for model release? Uh, I do have a model release for all my freckle uh, projects. Uh, models because that was kind of important for me to have. Those are a lot of people that I don't have the contact with anymore. And I had two expositions and those images are gonna be, some of the images are gonna be finally uh, for sale as prints via the Polish Art Now webpage. So that model release was really important, but with the magazines, I mean, if I will have a model release, it doesn't really matter because it's gonna be published in the magazine as well. The model is of course aware of this, but I've never used, um, um, the fashion images for any exposition. So that was more um, for the federal project. And answering the question, how do you find models? Again, like I'm mostly working right now with model agencies, but I remember that I used to um, fetch models on streets, but only for the freckle project. For the fashion stories, I still want to have very experienced models. We have like eight, 10 hours on set, which is very difficult and we have like, um, Within eight, hour, eight to ten hours, we had two hours prep. I mean, makeup and hair, and uh, sometimes also uh, trying on the styling beforehand. So it's very difficult on set to, um, to have, you know, have um, more time to work on the unexperienced model. So it's always better to have someone who's already been working on fashion shoots. Mm. Thank you, Agatha. How do you create a fashion team? Um, this I've already mentioned before. It's well, I have a team that I work with and I prefer to work with, but sometimes, of course, someone is not available and then I'm uh, either approaching uh, production um, production companies. They have, or, um, sorry, um, photographers, agents, they have also like, you know, like there's some agencies that are actually um, having those creative team or the creative people uh, that they are um, 
taking care of management of. And that's the first way to find a creative team. Instagram is the second, uh, second option, which is also great because you have almost everyone on Instagram right now. How do you connect iMac with BenQ? I don't connect iMac with BenQ. I have, uh, the iMac is something that I use, uh, I barely use anymore. BenQ is connected to my uh, MacBook Pro. So that's how I use it and that's how I retouch it. How many commercial sessions are you able to do during one month? Do you do only fashion photography? Um, yeah, I'm mainly focused on fashion photography right now and on the uh, work for fashion magazines as well. That's a very difficult question, but during the last weekend, so Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, I did three. I don't know if you guys hear me. Do you? Vincenzo, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'm seeing oh, here in the, the yeah, people are answering the Ganyuri, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Um, okay, but something happened with the webinar because that's what I what I meant. I cannot look at the questions anymore. Can you not see the questions tab? Uh, yeah, I'm still on it. Maybe two more. Thanks for the webinar, Arita. What are your favorite lenses for digital cameras and why? Um, my favorite is called the 40 that I showed you before. I think it's a great lens. It's like I told you, it's at the distance and it's just very light and you know, it's really easy for me on set. For the fashion uh, shoot, uh, I mostly use 35 millimeter um, 1.4, that's my favorite lens. Sometimes using also 85 millimeter, but barely. I don't really like that, uh, that lens, but it's sometimes handy when I have to have uh, a closer photo. Arita, did you say you better to capture one while shooting? I'm only using capture one while shooting commercial when we're in the studio. But when I'm on the location, I'm only using the iPad. Okay, I think we sent that we have answered the most important questions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for joining. I'm so sorry for the audio problems. I hope you will forgive me for this. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. And that was really, really nice to meet you at least via the comments and via the questions that Thank you, Vicente, so much for having me as well. It was really a pleasure. The pleasure was ours, Agatha, and, and I think the pleasure was also for everyone here uh, who visited today. And uh, I want to thank everyone for coming. Of course, thank you to Agatha as well. This has been such a fantastic learning opportunity to, to, to be here with her, to, to learn from someone with so much experience and uh, who really has such a, such a foothold in the industry. Uh, all these really, really fantastic insights that, uh, that she gave us today. And uh, to all of you, uh, uh, as I said, tomorrow you'll be receiving the recording of today's webinar. So if you didn't get all the notes that you wanted, don't worry, the recording will be sent to you. And uh, the discount code that you're seeing right now will also be sent to you tomorrow uh, in, the, in the email, and that'll be valid for one month. And of course, uh, follow Agatha on all of, all of her social media. She's always posting incredible stuff from her work and from her behind the scenes. There's always fantastic, fantastic work that she's putting there. And uh, of course, follow BenQ as well. We have uh, social media as well to promote webinars just like the one you're in right now, uh, all over the world. And uh, not just organized by myself, but just in a host of other different countries. I myself will be hosting one next week about nights, uh, nights, nighttime photography, which you won't want to miss, which is also fantastic. But from everyone here at BenQ, I want to say thank you. Thank you again to Agatha for, for the fantastic webinar. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you at the next, at the next webinar. Have a great evening.